On June 16, 1976, thousands of student protesters flooded the streets of Soweto, South Africa. That smack in the middle of apartheid. It was supposed to be a three-day peaceful protest against the government's mandate that obliged schools to teach numerous subjects in Afrikaans, a language associated with the white ruling class during apartheid. Nobody, not even the students, expected the march to be a big thing. But the student protest changed the history of the country, marking the beginning of a significant shift in the struggle against apartheid. I want to talk to you about the historical effectiveness of student protests in driving change, which will astonish you. I will first walk you through the incredible role that student activism played in ending apartheid in South Africa, a fascinating piece of proud history. And by examining this chapter, we can better understand the objectives of the ongoing student protests and encampments occurring today for Palestine across the world, which I will also explain in detail. These students are employing the same proven, very smart strategy as those who combated apartheid decades ago at great personal risk for the greater good of humanity. Apartheid South Africa stands as a powerful testament to the efficacy of sustained protests in driving social change, lest we forget it was in the face of one of recent history's most oppressive systems. While there is now widespread acknowledgement of the horrors of apartheid by the West, it was the complicity of the West that enabled these atrocities for decades, only ceasing when the West finally turned. Today, it is the same West whose structures persist in perpetuating the most sadistic oppression, enabling even graver atrocities against the Palestinian people. These structures of oppression are precisely what today's students are once again fighting against. In the West, the paramount battleground where Israel can be defanged and Palestine can be liberated. And they are using a similar approach to what students utilized in the 1980s to combat apartheid. So let's get, into, let's get into apartheid South Africa. Understanding the intractability of apartheid is crucial to grasp the formidable challenges that the students in the 60s, 70s, and 80s were able to overcome. Apartheid in South Africa enforced institutionalized racial segregation to maintain white minority dominance, supported by strict laws that marginalized the black majority for 46 years. Some quick examples of apartheid laws, just for you to get a sense of what we're talking about. Black communities were forcibly relocated from areas designated for white occupation to segregated townships, comprising only 13% of the land often with limited resources. Meanwhile, the white settler co community claimed the majority of the country for themselves. Positions of authority and skilled labor jobs were reserved for white folks, while black South Africans were restricted to low-paying menial jobs. Labor laws allowed employers uh, to pay black workers significantly lower wages than whites for the same work. Black people could not move around without a pass, or they could be jailed. The government purged the non-white population from the voters' role. They denied them the right to participate in democratic processes or have political representation. They outlawed mixed marriages. They segregated recreational spaces. They abolished mixed-race universities. In 1961, only 10% of black teachers had graduated high school. With the Bantu Education Act, a separate, inferior, and heavily censored education system was established for black folks, designed to indoctrinate students into accepting their inferior status in society. And now to add insult to injury, they were forced to learn it in the language of the oppressor, Afrikaans. So the Soweto students protested that policy on June 16, 1976, 28 years into apartheid, hoping to engage the government in forms of discussions about their curriculum. But the apartheid government took out their choppers and they turned their weapons onto the crowds of students and over the next few days killed over 150 students. In the aftermath of the Soweto massacre, student-led protests erupted across the country and authorities doubled down. They responded with such brutal repression that it resulted in the deaths of more than 600 protesters by early 1977. It has to be said that by then, the main political groups, the Communist Party, the African National Congress, ANC, and the Pan-Africanist Congress, PAC, who were leading the popular resistance against the regime, had already been banned for years. 
many anti-apartheid leaders were either forced into exile or, like Nelson Mandela, who was a prominent leader within the ANC, were sentenced to life in prison in 1962 for promoting communism and training guerrilla warfare recruits under the guise of terrorism. All this sounds so familiar, doesn't it? The government thought they had wiped the slate clean of resistance and could comfortably impose oppression on the black population without political resistance. But who stepped forward to escalate the struggle? The students. Alone. And it's important to acknowledge that the students not only faced a brutal regime at home, but also had to contend with the support of supposed international champions of freedom and democracy. And I'm talking about the United States, France, the UK, West Germany, and Israel, all of whom staunchly supported the apartheid regime. Over the next decade, the 60s, a generation of student activists led by figures like Steve Biko and the South African Students Organization intensified the fight against apartheid. The 1976 Soweto massacre catalyzed nation student protests who were met with extreme brutal police repression. Biko's subsequent arrest under the Terrorism Act and his death at the hands of authorities galvanized international outrage. Global student activism in the universities in the West further uh, fueled this momentum, pressuring Western universities to divest from apartheid-related investments. In the 1980s, trade embargoes against South Africa gained momentum as countries implemented economic sanctions. Ultimately, international pressure led to comprehensive sanctions by the U.S. and the U.K., who could no longer ignore their own complicity, which was the final blow. In 1989, Frederick Willem de Klerk, a longtime supporter of apartheid, was sworn in as president of South Africa, and in a shocking move, he unbanned the ANC, released Nelson Mandela from prison, and negotiated a transition to majority rule in his country. Four years later, Mandela's ANC won South Africa's first all-inclusive elections, leading to Mandela's historic inauguration as South Africa's first black president. It has become common knowledge that when you ask the question, how was apartheid dismantled in South Africa? The simple answer goes something like this. Years of violent internal protest led by students prompted international economic and cultural sanctions, which weakened white commitment, made apartheid quite expensive to uphold, and finally dismantled it. It all gained momentum because student protests were the fuel, albeit at very high cost, leading the axe that severed the head of the monster of apartheid to finish its grind thanks to the divestments and international sanctions who were also brought forth in part by international student activism. It is very important to keep this in mind because I will come back to it in a minute. In light of the six month orgy, of the most sadistic and psychopathic violence we all witnessed in Gaza from the Israeli state, the term genocide may not begin to encapsulate the extent of the atrocities. The horrors inflicted seem aimed not only at destruction and annihilation, but also at a grotesque and inhumane display of sadism that defies comprehension. The Global South has been denouncing Israel's war crimes and genocide for months, while the Global North has been complicit and not only turning a blind eye, but actively and directly nurturing the genocide. But in light of all of this, who has shown up in full force over the past three weeks in the Global North? The students. I don't know if you've seen some of the footage out of these campuses. Wow. The courage. It began on April 18th when the NYPD conducted mass arrests at Columbia University's peaceful encampment, calling for the university to sever its financial ties with Israel, just one day after its establishment. This action was carried out at the shameful request of the university administration led by its president, an Egyptian woman. The brutalization of their activism created a domino effect. 183 schools today are mobilizing. Even Tokyo is mobilizing. Look at this interactive map. And I would wager that the wide majority of those protesting are not even Arab. So what are they doing exactly? Why protests on college campuses in Boston and New York and DC and LA and London and Paris and Amsterdam and Tokyo for Palestine? And here is the very important answer. Universities have something called endowments. Endowments are funds or financial assets that are donated or bequeathed to universities and colleges for the purpose of providing ongoing financial support. 
So it's like a pool of money that the universities invest to make more money. These endowments are typically in invested in a diversified portfolio of assets, such as stocks, bonds, and real estate, with the goal of generating income and capital appreciation over time. Like a bank. So much so that we sometimes say universities are banks that also have classrooms. They are rich. And the earnings from the endowment investments are used to support various initiatives and activities within the university, including funding scholarships, uh, faculty salaries, research programs, campus infrastructure and uh, projects, and other educational and operational expenses. Okay. In the U.S., the top 15 universities like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, MIT, UPenn, etc., have about $327 billion dollars in endowments. So why are students setting up encampments across these university campuses to protest the genocide in Gaza? Because these universities are investing part of their endowments in companies and goods who are directly complicit in or benefiting from Israel's occupation and genocide of the Palestinians. And Israel runs deep in these campuses. Here is a daunting example. Many of these universities have investments with Lockheed Martin, the world's largest weapons manufacturer. This is a page on the Lockheed Martin website. Read the highlighted part with me. Lockheed Martin is proud of the significant role it has fulfilled in the security of the state of Israel. Our C-130 and F-16 aircraft have been faithfully serving the Israel Air Force since the 1970s, and the 1980s. The F-16s they are so proud to be providing the Israeli army with are what in large part butchered 15,000 children over the course of the past seven months. Helpless humans stuck in a concentration camp with nowhere to flee. Starved to death, genocided with their entire ecosystem decimated thanks in large part to the proud and faithful F-16s of Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin have deals worth billions and billions of dollars with Israel. Well, these campuses own stocks in the company that is genociding the children of Palestine. Well, the students are asking their universities to divest these stocks. Get it? Some other classic examples are uh, Hewlett Packard and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, who provide technology and services to the Israeli military and security forces, including biometric ID systems used at checkpoints in the occupied West Bank to police and abuse Palestinians, while the students want their universities to divest from HP and HPE. Motorola Solutions provides surveillance technology to Israeli military and security forces, which is used in the monitoring and control of Palestinian populations in the occupied territories. The students want their universities to divest from Motorola Solutions. Elbit Systems is an Israeli defense electronics company that produces drones, surveillance systems, and other military equipment used in the occupation of Palestinians. Divest. Bank Hopo Alim and Bank Lumi. These Israeli banks have been accused of financing Israeli settlements in the occupied territories and providing loans to companies involved in the construction of illegal settlements. Divest. G4S, a British multinational security company that profits from the incarceration of Palestinian political prisoners and child abductees as it provides services to Israeli prisons and checkpoints in the occupied territories, as well as to Israeli settlements and businesses. By the way, thanks to the efforts of Columbia Prison Divest, Columbia University was the first U.S. institution of higher education to announce that it was divesting from G4S and other private prison companies after a years-long campaign by students in 2015. But the reason had nothing to do with Israel. In 2020, the United Nations published a list of 112 companies with business ties to Israeli settlements in occupied Palestine. The latest updated list is 97. Well, this list includes companies like Airbnb, Booking.com, and TripAdvisor, as well as most of the companies that I just mentioned. So these universities, as part of their global investment portfolio, have investments in many of these companies and funds that are complicit in or benefiting from Israel's human rights abuses. So what is the ask? What is the opposite of invest? The word is divest. The ask is to sell off investments to divest stocks of companies doing business with the Israeli occupation and contributing to the Israeli genocide. This is the D 
and BDS, Boycott, Divest, Sanction, the global campaign that was started in 2005 by Palestinian civil society organizations as, as a nonviolent means of protesting Israel's occupation and human rights abuses. Now, it is challenging to determine the exact percentage of their endowment funds allocated to these companies without de access to detailed information about their investment holdings. Not to mention that many of these universities use complex investment structures, making it difficult to track individual investments, especially if they are held indirectly through investment funds or pooled investment vehicles. This is why one of the demands of the students is also an increase in transparency about their university's investment holdings. Now, this brings me back to South Africa. I said a few minutes ago, how was apartheid dismantled in South Africa? I answered, Years of violent internal protest prompted international economic and cultural sanctions, which weakened white commitment and made apartheid quite expensive to uphold and finally dismantled it. For the record, while many nations were complicit, let it be known which countries prolonged the suffering and dehumanization of millions of South Africans by staunchly backing the apartheid regime for decades, the United States and Israel. The United States extended so much military, economic and diplomatic backing to the South African apartheid government until the late 1980s that the U.S. single-handedly prolonged the apartheid regime's tenure in power and postponed its potential demise. The United Kingdom, France and West Germany also bear responsibility for their role in supporting apartheid, albeit to a lesser extent than the United States. They condemned apartheid but still maintained economic ties. But the worst was Israel. Their support for apartheid South Africa was the most egregious. Israel provided arms, military training, military technology, extensive technical assistance, economic and diplomatic support to the South African government, directly empowering it to maintain deeply oppressive control over the majority black population. Israel has a notorious history of supporting brutal regimes. I encourage you to read about it. Not only neglecting human rights and international justice, but also actively supporting actions that violate these principles locally and abroad. No one should ever forget Israel's unwavering support for apartheid South Africa. And there is nothing more beautiful than to see South Africa taking Israel to court today for genocide. The liberation of South Africans could have been hastened if the U.S. and the U.K. joined efforts to impose sanctions earlier. Well, who, in large part, beat them into concessions? The students in the West who mirrored the fight of their South African counterparts. In the 1980s, campuses across the United States became hotbeds of activism against apartheid South Africa, igniting a movement that would play a pivotal role in the collapse of the oppressive regime. It began with protests at UC Berkeley, where students demanded that the university divest from companies doing business in South Africa. This movement quickly spread nationwide and worldwide. As universities across the Western world faced mounting pressure from student activists, they began to divest from South African apartheid and related goods. Barclays Bank, for instance, was famously pressured by students in the UK to withdraw from the apartheid state. The same for Shell, Coca-Cola, and IBM. This financial pressure, combined with the global outcry against apartheid, proved to be a significant blow to the regime. Ultimately, the campus protests and the divestment movement contributed to the collapse of the apartheid system, demonstrating the power of student activism in effecting meaningful change on a global scale. The students for Palestine today are utilizing a similar strategy, and they are doing it at the expense of their own livelihoods. They're getting arrested, expelled, suspended from their universities, and blacklisted by companies who won't hire them, companies that are complicit in genocide. But even though the price is steep, it is a winning formula. Over the past three weeks, at least seven schools have agreed with students on investment transparency and considering divestment from Israel. I am so extremely proud of these students. And it must be emphasized that student-led protests hold immense historical significance in advancing causes that improve the quality of life for all and are always met with brutal force. 
The student-led U.S. civil rights sit-ins in the 1960s played a crucial role in desegregating public spaces and advancing the civil rights movement in the United States. In France, the momentous protests of May 1968, which were started by students, sparked significant social reforms, so much so that May 68 is considered a cultural, social, and moral turning point in the nation's history. The 1989 Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia began with remarkable nonviolent student protests, leading to the overthrow of the communist government. The anti-Vietnam student protests, which erupted across college campuses in the U.S. during the late 60s and early 70s, played a significant role in shaping public opinion and ultimately contributing to the eventual withdrawal of U.S. troops from Vietnam. Even the student-led movements that did not achieve their immediate goals and paid a very high price, such as the pro-democracy student-initiated protests in Beijing's Tiananmen Square in 1989, which was violently crushed by the Chinese government, resulting in hundreds, possibly thousands of deaths, have changed the world. Students really have always been at the heart of social change. Emphasis on the word heart, where compassion and empathy emerge from, the essence and epitome of humanity that is the glue of what keeps this world palatable. And every single one of these student protests was met with brutal repression by government authorities, and they were all accused of the same thing. Every single one, that they are led by outside agitators, brainwashed, radical extremists working for outside disruptors, a common tactic used by authorities to discredit and delegitimize student protests throughout history. Well, the same is happening to the students protesting genocide today. They're accused of being led by outside agitators. Look at this New York Times headline. A large majority of those arrested after Columbia University building was seized were affiliated with the school, but some were outsiders. So insidious. New York Times always on point with their precise journalism. Accusations of outside agitation are made to deflect attention from the underlying causes of the protests and to justify repressive measures taken against unarmed students who have really been brutalized by the state. But history has shown that student protests are always driven by genuine grievances and a desire for social and political change, with students taking up leadership roles and advocating not even for their own rights, but for the rights of others and at the expense of their very own livelihoods. And there's nothing more noble than that. We started by speaking about South Africa and how apartheid was in major part dismantled thanks to the activism of students. The comparison between the two apartheid systems of South Africa and Israel reveals stark similarities. Yet the oppressive measures employed by the Israeli state against Palestinians to the admission of South Africans themselves surpass those of the Afrikaners in South Africa. Indeed, as survivors of apartheid, South Africans have a unique perspective to identify apartheid, and they have repeatedly said that what Israel is practicing in Palestine is far worse than South African apartheid. Palestinians endure a disturbing combination of settler colonialism and a hyper-violent military occupation, deprived of their historical rights and subjected to daily violence and dispossession. By Israel. Gaza in particular faced prolonged military assaults and an illegal blockade for years and, is, and has been undergoing a horrendous live stream genocide for seven months. While copy pasting the trajectory of South Africa is not the ask, Palestinian resistance methods and international solidarity efforts are smartly utilizing a lot of the same resources. The fight is in the West. The Zionist movement relied heavily on Western support for its colonial and genocidal project, leading to Israel's notorious brutality due to a dire lack of accountability. Israel is deeply criminal because they get away with it all. And Western powers are responsible for that, as they are complicit, all of them, in Israel's genocidal actions. These same powers once backed apartheid South Africa, branding figures like Nelson Mandela as terrorists and designated organizations like the African National Congress as terrorist groups. Let it be known that it was not until July 1st, 2008, that the U.S. removed Mandela's terrorist designation. Mandela, whose birthday is an international day to honor his legacy of promoting peace 
reconciliation and social justice was labeled a terrorist by the West. This is the same man who said, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Well, if you did not believe him, the students are here to prove it. Apartheid and genocide will not be normalized, not under our watch. So let us support the students. Let's amplify their voices and efforts, donate to their encampments, follow their groups on social media. I will link some names in the caption below. To the students leading the charge, your passion, resilience, and unwavering commitment to justice will change the world. Thank you for your courage, your sacrifice, and your tireless pursuit of a more just world. Onwards and upwards.